I think knowing what's in your toolbox is super important as a limitation. I think that's why being an EMT is so, it's very easy to look skilled because like I just have a wrench in my toolbox because of the scope. Obviously they jump, they just drastically obviously going all the way through the spectrum. So I think a lot of people, they have so many skills in their toolbox and I'm sure everyone's seen it here that they're like, they're trying to focus all at once when in reality I can just go, okay, circulation, airway, breathing, all right, are they like doing that or? <laughs> and I think a, a lot of people get lost in the sauce with that specifically and it's way easier when your toolbox is way smaller and then obviously you move up once you've mastered whatever tools are in there. And I, I think that's important just to quantify things for sure. Hmm. I think when I was working as a tech in the ER, like. There was nothing worse than being pivot. <laughs> there was nothing the worse than being the face of the ER with like 50 patients on the board trying to figure out what acuity they are by just looking at them because you don't have your vitals yet because yeah. there's a line out the door and trying to see who's going to be violent next and who's going to pop off with the person over here and yeah. who's going <laughs> who's gonna to start fighting each other. Right, exactly. Yeah. And just, uh, I know that that's nothing compared to um, dealing with a bunch of patients that you're actively treating, but... Oh my God, that was the most overwhelming thing. Just trying to figure out, just by looking at people and then trying to make sure that the atmosphere was okay for everyone yeah. as well. And mm -hmm. there's children over here, so this person yeah. who's clearly on meth, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. stay over that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was stressful. I can't even imagine adding the medications and medicine onto that. Especially if like it is a really busy waiting room, which fortunately I feel like has gotten better over the years instead mm -hmm. of worse, but I mean, some systems still deal with these insanely chaotic waiting rooms where there's, I mean, there's, you know, dozens of people waiting and you're like, you're having to like visually reassess them and be like, does that one need to go back or can does we wait? Is that yeah. one still conscious? <laughs> Are they that one's really slumped in a wheelchair. Maybe we need to recheck them. Like, and, and you're, you're just sitting there staring at all of them and then they're all asking you when they can go back and. Mm. Yeah, that, that part does look really tough. Fun. It was fun to get to know all the providers, though. I think yeah, working with true. all the PAs, the M NPs, and the MDs was just a, a blast because mm -hmm. it's just you and them and then some everybody else trying to, like, keep the show running, you know? Yeah. It's just, yeah. It, it is a nice microcosm for that camaraderie mm -hmm. up there, for sure. It's, oh, yeah. You definitely realize who your resources are, and so that, that's always a good good experience. The ER in general, I feel like, is really good teamwork-wise, camaraderie-wise. I felt like on the ambulance, it was less so. Like, you and your partner are a team, but depending on where you're running, who you're running with, you may not even really know them, and it may not be much of a team atmosphere on scene. It can really vary a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that is one nice thing about the ER, I think, that we have as an advantage is, like, there's no, like, adversarial relationship with the providers or the nurses or the techs. Like, everyone works really well together. And on the rare cases where I see like interpersonal conflict, like there's always some resolution of it. Like people go talk or, you know, like it gets resolved. I feel like it doesn't really get just swept under the rug and ignored. Like, so I think the team atmosphere is held together pretty well. It's nice that everybody's like in the same place because when you get, uh, get out, you know, different specialties will have, you know, the doctor's call room or the tech will be up front and not really interacting much with the back. And I feel like there's a lot of mixing. Everybody's, you know, on the floor, yeah. the same place. People aren't really going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps a lot to keep building that team, like, approached yeah. with patients and helps. I think one, one, like, skill or quality I've had to develop, too, is, like, a thick skin. Because, I mean, whether it's a patient that's really belligerent towards us or like a consult that doesn't go well and they know I'm a PA so they treat me like crap on the phone or whatever and like there's a lot of stuff you gotta let roll off of you or it's really gonna affect your day. Like if you take that into the next patient encounter because the last patient just yelled at you for no reason, like you have to let stuff just roll off of you, I think in a way that's pretty unique to emergency medicine. Like there's not a lot of fields where that has to be the case because you can't just be, you can't go cry in a corner for five minutes. Like you got, an, you've got something else to go do. You've got another patient to go see. And so I think it's really important to be like, well, that's kind of more reflective of the person that yelled at me than it is of me or how I'm practicing medicine or even the consultants, you know, like, okay, they, maybe I didn't give the best report, but I've got a lot of patients going on and I'll do better next time, but I'm not going to dwell on it. You know, I think otherwise, you know, you end up getting burned out. That was actually the first thing that I thought of when you asked the question. 
I was like, you have to have a thick skin. Mm. That, that's what you develop in this job. Yeah. <laughs> because people are really mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, you get called all kinds of names. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> There's been some really original names that yeah. people have come up with. I've like, been oh. kicked out before. Oh, I love getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I was like, thank you. I don't so want sorry. to be here. I have to go now. <laughs> You're like, no, dang it. <laughs> it's usually, you know, some sort of substance involved. Yeah. <laughs> we had this uh, super grizzled old <laughs> doctor that was in our training program that had worked pretty much everywhere. You know, worked in these small, you know, rural emergency departments. And he had done EMS before as well and was one of the EMS directors and had done EMS everywhere. And I kind of looked to him as a major mentor because I felt like every situation he always seemed to know what to do and... He told me one time that he was like, I, I might be able to maybe give a little bit less good care than a specialist would. Like, so let's say if a cardiologist was taking care of this person out in the sticks somewhere, maybe they'd be able to make a decision that was a little bit better than mine. But they don't work out there. The patient's got me, and I'm doing the very best I can do, and then I'm getting into the right spot. And that put a lot of pressure off me too, you know, to realize that. I am the person that's available. I am there. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do the very best I can with the skills I have. And then if a consultant says, well, why did you do that? I explain this is the best I could do. I was trying to do my like the best choice I could for the patient. And it just takes pressure off you and realizes it's not, not personal. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're the one that the patient need needs at that time. Right. <laughs> when you were talking about being in fast track, it made me think of my very first day in fast track, which was probably one of the worst days oh, really? I've ever had. <laughs> Why is that? In any job. Um, it was so busy. This I, was I, miss, I miss working with you. In fast track. <laughs> <laughs> not, <laughs> not even our fast track or that one. It was, was the, other the downtown one. fast track. The downtown yeah. fast track. And there was like 30 people in line. Was I there? No. Really? It was just me oh, and like one no. other person and a provider and three rooms. And I was like, so you want me to check these people in? <laughs> you want me to kind of assess them and medicate them and get vitals and give them their discharge paperwork? And you want this done in three hours? <laughs> like, there's 30 people. Yeah. This is not gonna happen oh that's where you're like slowly crawling to like 4pm like, or whatever you're off this is the worst day what did I get myself into just quits just walks right out the door <laughs> well we survived barely but it was a really rough day I will say that's when you find out who your people are for sure yes it's oh, yeah. the yes, most yes. supportive career field I've ever been in outside of I do actually it was things, one of our nurse managers came and started helping me and I was like I remember thank that god no, yeah. thank you mm-hmm Thank yeah. you. One time it was made my day better. <laughs> me and one of the nurse managers. She came in early, yeah. and we literally uh, did all of the triaging. There was it was a line out the door. It was just me and her, and Dang. did all the IVs. There was no provider up front yet. It was just. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. There's been some wild days down there. <laughs> yeah, there has. Do you guys have any impactful stories about your time in emergency medicine, or a particular patient encounter that still sticks with you? I have one that uh, kind of always kind of comes up a little bit. It was, uh, I had not yet like decided to do emergency medicine. I was just on one of those month things when I was a medical student and working in the emergency department on that, it was a night shift. And at the time I was pretty sure, I was like, pretty sure I don't want to do emergency medicine. I don't know if I can do the nights and I'm not sure if it has like the interaction that I'm like looking for. And young, young uh, kid came in, he's probably late twenties, I think, or younger, um, and he was trying to get off alcohol. That was his whole goal. He came in with his, his fiance and they were going to get married in like two weeks. So it was like one of the things he was trying to do for his like wedding was to be off alcohol. So we did a bunch of panels and we were trying to get kind of get things going better. He'd come in for some stomach pain and all of a sudden the nurse comes in and says, we don't have a pulse. You know, we activate everything. It's big code. And so we're coding this young kid and I was, I'd never really seen a code before. That was pretty much one of the first times and we're doing the code. I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure we're going to get him back. You know, he's a young, young guy and we keep working him, keep working him. It's like 45 minutes in and I can tell it's like not going well. You can tell, you see the, like the attending doctors like starting to you know, know that, Hey, we're going to prep for stopping. And so we go to the family room, which at the time just had the fiance in it. Um, 
one of the nurses had called for his mom and dad to come too. So we had the whole family coming in, but the doctor came in and he said, Hey, you know what? This is what's going on. Um, this is Andrew, the med student. He's going to stay here with you and answer any questions that you have. And I was like, what? The <laughs> it's like, I don't know nothing. And I, I just talked with her and there weren't really much, there wasn't much I could answer, but the whole experience really hit home how human what we do is especially in in the emergency realm both pre-hospital and in the ed and it was a you know terrible experience for that family for me for everybody involved but what i took away from that was that those things happen regardless of whether i'm there or not and so to have that experience and that that honor of being with someone when they're in those worst scenarios really it gave me a fulfillment in the job that i had never felt in any of the other mm. specialties and not that you can't have them in the other other specialties or pre-hospital but for me it was that moment where i was like i i really want to do this i can get past working weekends and working you know switch shifting between nights because it's that human interaction that i'm looking for i wanted to be relevant to mm. someone and for me i still remember that even though we didn't have a good medical outcome how, how appreciative the family was for all of the efforts we did and to be there with them during this really difficult time. And so that's, that'll always stick with me as, as a kind of defining feature of, of emergency care and, and kind of being that first line for me. Yeah, that's a good mentality. Do you, do you go into every shift with that mentality? I feel like you more so than maybe any other ER provider gets more compliments for how you handle patients and staff than anybody I know. So I'm just curious kind of what your mindset is going into shifts because yeah. I feel like you know how to talk to people. Uh, it's kind of you said, it maybe looks on the outside, but inside I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I think, so I had a string of probably six months of like multiple um, scenarios kind of like that. Uh, where either we had a death or something really bad happened. And it sort of jarred me into getting out of out of that. And, and hopefully this never happens, but yeah, I think it's really easy to get calloused and forget that human side. Mm-hmm. And so there's plenty of shifts where I'm going in and I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling it today. But I, what I try to do is think just for a quick second, like if that was my family or I or that was my brother, the young guy that came in, you know what how can i like still put on a, a face that is is human or like remembers the human aspect and i mm-hmm. think those experiences had i not had them i would not be able to do that but mm-hmm. having that one after another after another just reminding me of these are actual people we're taking care of and all the stresses of the job and trying to jump tasks you know different tasks if i feel like that's happening too much i think that patient pops in my head um, or another one and and just reminds me, hey, like slow down just a second, and, like yeah. remember. But it's hard, and then it's I'm definitely far, far from perfect at doing that. And like I said, I think it's easier to look, see on the outside, whether than like then that's not really how I'm feeling on the inside. But I think remembering that makes a big difference for me. Well, I think I mean a key part of what you're saying is like when you're putting the focus on somebody outside of yourself throughout the day, like when you go home at night, you're going to feel much better about your job much better about your career when you're like focused on other people throughout the day. If I'm just worried about like, gosh, I haven't peed in a half hour. I got to pee really bad. I didn't get to eat my food on time. I've had no water today. Like I didn't sleep good last night. I've got to see another patient and then another patient. And I don't look at any of them as this human being that this is a really bad day for them. They're really worried about something. Then I go home at the end of the day and I'm just focused on myself and how bad I feel, how tired I am. Versus I think when you actually focus on the patients you're taking care of, that will actually like rejuvenate you at the end of your shift. And like you go home much more satisfied with what you've done. And then that of course reflects on your patient care and patients actually feel cared for and the staff sees that too. So I think that's, that's a huge point. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's self-preservation sometimes too, to approach it that way in a way. Cause I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you guys feel this way too, but sometimes I like never feel on my game, right? Like every shift I'm like, I'm kind of tired or like I didn't sleep good or I'm just not feeling it today. And I feel like, especially me personally, like if I don't somehow get out of my head with that, every shift will be hard. Mm -hmm. And I never like really feel that one shift where I'm just like, yeah. 
But then if I can sort of forget that and focus on the patient, then it's almost a way that I can preserve myself too. It's like a burnout like strategy mm-hmm. a little bit too. Kind of like what you had mentioned, if you can do that for one patient at least, a shift, your mind kind of sort of forgets how uncomfortable you are and yeah. then you're, you're a little more apt to have a good shift. At least I feel like it. Yeah, I personally have to be very intentional about it because I will naturally go into like kind of machine mode. Like we're going to do all this. They're all they're all just patients to me. They're all not humans. Like I'm just going to go down the list and do all this as fast. That's my natural oh, yeah. inclination. But I think that leads to burnout if that's all you do. There's some days where like maybe you got to do that for a few hours, but I have to be intentional when I sit down at the bedside. And that's why oftentimes I'll try to sit down at the bedside look the patient in the eyes and talk with them. Cause if I'm not intentional about it, my natural bent will not be to do that. Um, and that will lead to burnout. I think, I think, I think doing it on every patient probably le- leads to some burnout too. Like I think you maybe can overdo it if oh, you're, yeah. if you're sitting there and empathizing with every single patient and taking on their burdens and their stories. And, you know, I think there's, there's probably excess on either side of that spectrum, but um, I think we all try to achieve that balance because that's that's where the you know not burning out is found. I think. Yeah, it's like I try to do my best to remember that if this person's here on their worst day, at their worst moment, if it is you know that, or we have our patient who took an ambulance ride for a splinter, you know, try to <laughs> try to empathize with everybody, but um, also don't put up with shit in a way, mm-hmm. like because there's that balance i think of standing up for it and advocating for your patient but also putting an end to i mean like you know you can't talk to the staff that way mm-hmm. we're really good i think at least where we are that we have so many resources and assets that and training and some are better than others but we have a team where it's just like i hear a patient yelling down the hall at one of my my new nurses i'm gonna come over mm-hmm. and then do we need security do we need yeah. other people involved or Whatever it is, it's that fine line of being like, I know you don't feel good, but you still can't treat everybody like garbage. Yeah, well, there, there has to be those boundaries set mm-hmm. too, right? We can't expect to be treated poorly either. You know, we're there every day and in the ER, like you're going to be treated poorly. Mm-hmm. So if you don't, you know, set limits on that, patients are going to take advantage of it, I think. Yeah. And I actually remember it's like not everyone, like when we have those um, substance or intoxicated patients and then... You know, they're 12 hours later. They're like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you have some remorse for your actions. <laughs> yeah. No worries. We don't care. It's, you know, moving on. It's all good, man. Here's a sandwich. Take your day break. You're good. It happens. Here's and then soup. move on with your day, you know. See, Had a couple amb- of those. Sorry. Okay. I didn't mean to cut you off. On the ambulance, you don't always get to have that, like, closure. Yeah. Like, sometimes, a lot of times, people are just not very nice to you. Yeah. And if you are just running calls where people are not very nice to you, <laughs> then that makes it really difficult to have any ounce of empathy towards them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like another call. Yeah. You know, so I think that it's helpful if you just like the things about your job that you enjoy, like, I don't know, providing good patient care like on a, on a critical patient sometimes that's the stuff that i personally grasp onto mm-hmm. yeah. to make me want to come to work the next day yeah and even the little moments with the patients that are not necessarily like maybe you don't do any cool paramedic skills on them but at least if it's a nice old lady you can have a conversation <laughs> with just a relief of a different they're my age. favorite because <laughs> i do think paramedics struggle to a certain degree by like fixating on like the quality of their life is totally dependent on how many paramedic things I did this week. And if the answer is zero paramedic things this week, they're having a bad time. And I think that's a bad mentality because a lot, I mean, I was too, I did it all the time really too. Am. Like, I was like, I haven't innovated anybody this week. What a waste of my skills. I can't believe I shouldn't have even bothered going to work. I didn't even innovate anyone. What am I even doing? But like, but if you can take some of those nice moments, like the little old lady that's just got a UTI and you just had a good conversation with her on the way in, like you got to take that stuff and use it as fuel to keep doing your job. You can't use all these crazy skills that you may or may not get to use Mm -hmm. to like, you know, build you up and give you energy. You have to use like these other positive things, I think. And and the belligerent patients, the ones that treat you terrible, that's always going to just burn you out. And like, there's not any overcoming that, I think, but you just got to figure out other strategies to deal with that. But if you can take like at least the nice patients, even if they weren't dying and use those, I think as fuel, that's helpful. Yeah. We just had one 
I was like, I needed you. <laughs> More than you needed me. <laughs> it's when you get a nice patient, you're just like, thank yeah. you. Tell she us the nice patient like, story. Oh, well, she broke her hip. <laughs> but she's like this 90 So she did need lady. you. She least. really did. So <laughs> she, she wasn't acting. Things. <laughs> she wasn't acting like your typical, like, hip fracture old lady, like, in a lot of pain. She was in no pain unless she moved, like, huh. trying to bear weight on it. And she's like, it's like a four. And I was like. <laughs> But you can't walk, so we need to take you to the hospital. I think, you, I think it's chance. broken. She's like, I've never broken a bone. Dang. <laughs> she was so cute. Anyways, she definitely had a fracture. <laughs> but anyway, she was the nicest lady, and we just talked about her whole life on the way. <laughs> and we were, like, really far east. <laughs> so it was, it was nice, though. I was like, oh, I needed her. Yeah. Because... Otherwise, it's been boring. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm very much like you, too, where I'm like, what am I even doing here? I'm not doing any of my skills. Right. I'm, I have to remember all this stuff for what? I haven't been doing anything. Right. So I'm remember in my dry spell. Yeah. Hopefully, it doesn't keep lasting. But <laughs> the old lady was great. I think doing anything you can to like make it a normal work day, if that's a good way to say it, helps me a lot with the burnout thing. Because a lot of people, like in a lot of other jobs, you know, they got their routines. Like they'll go, come in and, you know, open their email and like go to lunch or whatever. But for us, it's like every day is so dependent on who comes in, in a way. Mm-hmm. So what I've been trying to do is find like the little things I can do to control my day. So like for me, I love music, always have, love going to concerts. And for a long time, didn't have music playing like when I was at work just because I didn't really know how to do it. So my wife got me this tiny little speaker and it sort of just stays in that tiny bubble where I'm at, but then I can put on like my music or my playlist or whatever. And that's made a huge difference. And I'm, like, I remember one shift where it was like 11 PM and there was like a baby crying. And this dude was like barfing in like room four. <laughs> and like some dude like kept like, like farting in the other room too. <laughs> and I was like, what am I doing here, man? It's like my like desk was like right in the middle of all of that junk. And, uh, like something like snapped in my brain and I was like I'm putting music on and it totally changed my life now wow. you can't can't do that in every like scenario maybe not in the ambulance but right. like trying to find a couple of things that you love and like doing that and like making it part of your day because it is just our normal work day so like figuring out how to be able to approach it as a normal work day for us even though it's other people's worst worst days but like you said you cannot like you can't internalize that or you will just you know, cr- get crushed under everybody's mm-hmm. sorrows. So, like, trying to find a way to, you know, do that, do the best care you can, but then have these little things that you like, you put chocolate in your lunch or whatever, you know, yeah. something that you like. Makes yeah, I think, yeah, like, controlling anything. I mean, there's so much that we can't control. I think taking control of some aspects, like a little thing in your environment is super important. Yeah. For me, it's like I, li- I like to get up early and at least exercise and drink some water before I go into work. If I can do that at least, I've controlled – the tiny little part of my day that I actually have some control over before I go into the chaos that's, you know, inevitable is, you know, doing something at least in my morning. And that's true even just with kids. Like, my as soon as my girls are up, it's going to be, they're going to be screaming chaos. and free, yep. it's going to be, be, ins- schedule, it's gonna yeah. be insane. So, like, if I want to control any aspect of a, a day off, too, I have to get up before they get up because once they get up, they're going to commandeer everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have, like... I had like two, three straight months where I was coming home and just basically peeing straight brown or yellow, right? right? You're just not drinking. Put yourself in a wrap. Exactly. Totally wrapped up. So I like, I started bringing a camel back to work, which looks ridiculous. You you guys may have seen me at work, like just sucking on this little tube. One patient asked if I was like, uh, asked if I was huffing something. And I was like, no, I'm not huffing something. This is like my water. But uh, it made a made a big difference, for, and then I'm gonna probably start filling it with like root beer, or, like, or, like <laughs> lemonade, something I want. But it like made a big difference. Where I was like, I'm controlling this at least. I'm drinking more, not yeah. peeing as brown, so yeah. that's good. Yeah, I try to drink a gallon every day, so I I make that a number one priority. Is like if I sit down on my computer, I can drink water while I'm I'm like Dwight Trude in the office, like always working and drinking out of the Camelback, like no wasted seconds. I'm like dictating and taking a sip of water and putting in orders. <laughs> You're better than me. I told people if I could check you in with a cigarette, lit cigarette, oh. hanging out of my, <laughs> my mouth, I would. I'm just letting you know. So. It's like those oil riggers, yeah. no shirt on, a cigarette yeah. out, just like 
<laughs> champing yeah. it up. She's got into medicine the wrong way. Yeah, I know, right? I should have got 40s over yeah. that set. All right. I think it'll swing back. Like, cigarettes will be healthy again in a couple it's of like years. Eggs. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a pendulum it's thing. It swings back and forth. Vapes are out. Smoking's <laughs> cool. Yeah. 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 What other burnout strategies do you guys have? Exercise. Yeah. I have two things that I that it makes me think of. Um, the first one being that in the ER, when we would all, like have a really crappy day and maybe the um the waiting room smelled like crap as well i would start um nebulizing coffee yeah. and tape Ooh, it to the wall idea. that was a high iq move yeah yeah, yeah. we that's sweet. we would have a really good time after and then i start playing music because we would we'd have some really bad days and yeah. i would and it would make my day better and make everybody else's day better <laughs> and we wouldn't have to smell like whatever yeah. was going on in the waiting room yeah. too <laughs> um the other thing that I've recently started doing is planning trips while I'm at work. <laughs> so I know it's like, it's, if I have some downtime, then yes, then that's what I will be doing is I'll don't, be on. Don't worry, we get it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't have to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll be on Airbnb like, oh, this is a great house. So I'm like, got a hot tub? Look at this kayak. <laughs> yeah. The, oh, God. The, yeah. Kayak. Yeah. And I'll start planning things. And oh, man, it makes it amazing when I get off work and I have a trip planned that mm. I get to go and do. And just kind of decompress it's it's been absolutely wonderful like it has <laughs> changed my life <laughs> that's awesome i like that strategy i don't think everyone's anyone's ever mentioned that one before that's a good mm-hmm. one especially if you're somewhere where you have like some downtime periodically instead of just like scrolling social media like planning something fun that's mm-hmm. a good one i feel like morale i think people in management positions can overthink boosting morale i i brought in a goat that when you press on it oh the screaming goat yeah, yeah, yeah. and then just yeah. every time you get a patient that's incredibly rude to you you just go click the goat and it just does that blood curdling scream <laughs> and just, uh, take a breath and like just like, like bringing stickers in that are funny or just that's food exactly yes i think you actually gave me a sticker like two years Probably. ago I still have um, all the stickers you can me. Exactly. Yeah. I think that that's why I was like, yeah. I vaguely recognize. What do some of the stickers have on them? Oh, I think like, I've seen some of them. Like that's why I'm asking. Hot memes, you know? Yeah. Just funny. Just variety packs off of Amazon. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, you get it like 300 packs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just a bunch of random ones. It's, we're very simple. Yeah. <laughs> like, There's a bunch of stars that say fuck off. Yeah. 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 Those are my yeah. personal just like, favorite. Yeah. Holy shit. And then I'll yeah. have the, like, the good ones. And... Pain scale only goes to 10. Exactly. I like that one a lot. It doesn't go to 11. Uh, I always say so ten. That pain <laughs> ten scale. Is that pain scale is the there. most useless thing. <laughs> I, I wish you guys. Be so nice. I wish they didn't make you guys ask that because it is <laughs> the most useless thing. My ever. buddy sent me one from. It was a. There's a naval hospital in Portsmouth, uh, Virginia, and they use one that um, he e- or she emailed his wife emailed to me. But it's like five is like bees, and then like six is bees, and you're just running, and it's just got it's comical. And I don't I'm just, get it. Like, what do you mean bees? It's like bees. Like, like the, are those like bees that hurt? Oh, and then it's okay. like someone screaming and running and screaming <laughs> okay. bees, and it was like mauled by a bear. And then oh, okay. ten is unconscious in a coma. And I, I used to love showing patients. I'd read the room. I'd be like, yeah, hey, yeah, like, yeah. how bad's your pain? <laughs> And I just, you know, it kind of takes 10 off the table. Which I think <laughs> yeah. it's reasonable. Uh, but it's just like, it's just simple little things, yeah. I think, that was. But I was like, hey, the DOD, the Navy, listen, the Navy's <laughs> using this. I tried to make copies. So maybe it'll catch on in the civilian world at I some point. Mauled by a bear should be on the page. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I've used that sentence too many Perfect. times. When I was on the trauma floor, I was just like, normal surgeries or, you know. They didn't have an NG in, they didn't have wound backs, they didn't have anything like that. They were getting discharged after like a, a normal like coli or something and you're like a ten out of ten. It's like, okay, maybe nine. I'm like <laughs> I don't care either way, I'm still it's gonna give you little pain wins. meds. It's just you know, <laughs> just, curious, just curious. You don't have anything to prove here. You're yeah. getting some pain meds either way. Yeah. Like I just have to put a number on the computer. It <laughs> does not affect Whether me. ten or four, you're yeah. still getting some more. Still getting whatever, way, it's but... fine. <laughs> I think that's important like you said holding people accountable but also advocating educating is very because we had a conversation earlier with our manager and it was just a case of someone that was waiting in the waiting room and i think they had worked for the company and they just i think they didn't think they were being seen quick enough and she's like yeah and they said they had like a nine out of ten pain and i had to explain everybody says they have a nine out of ten pain that's why when i like you have to be very explicit because obviously you know, my stub toe to me is way worse than that gunshot wound 
because it's very personal. Mm -hmm. So I think educating people so that they give us a realistic progression of pain is super important. Because if you're just 99999 because I want pain meds, like you all are talking about, it's just kind of hard to gauge, especially with some people, you know, those people that hide pain well or Mm -hmm. actually have a high pain tolerance as opposed to the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah, like my hip fracture. Yeah. 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 It's always the old ladies who are like, it's fine. It's like, Yeah, some, I, I think, I mean, some of the past generations, they grew up where pain is like a part of life, like mm-hmm. whether mental or physical pain, like life was hard for mm-hmm. a, a lot, a long time, I think. And they just grew up being very stoic. So it takes a lot to, to really make them react. I remember one time when I was working in the ER and this guy had checked in because he had an ingrown toenail and he was like 10 out of 10 pain it was so painful i remember our waiting room was packed right Mm -hmm. and overhead you hear uh level one trauma coming to like recess one and then it was like level level one trauma coming to recess two um we have a code blue in rooms two and six and then it was like uh there's a heart attack or what was it chest stemmy stemmy alert coming in um in like five minutes and then it was like two more like traumas and stuff and i just watched that guy stand up and walk out (laughs) and i was like all right he's like i think i've made a mistake i'm in the wrong company yeah i'm gonna go up to there and carry down the street yep i've made a mistake I love when fate works out like that. <laughs> yeah, I think someone also like passed out in the waiting room too. Like it was, yeah. it was, it was just one, one of those days. 